formally acknowledged country, the, the many and various countries in which we all meet today, and there's hundreds of us here watching. Um, so to the, the elders, past and present, traditional owners, um, we, we pay respects to you, and particularly with regard to our emerging leaders, particularly in West Sydney, the largest single urban indigenous population in Australia. Um, also to our traditional sponsors in Deloitte and West Sydney Uni, uh, thank you for your support. This is, a, this is our first foray of a future forum online, so the future is here and appears to be online. Um, Minister, chance to have a chat to you, and uh, we've offered through the Q&A button our, uh, our, our viewers to join in that debate later on after we've chat to you in a little response panel, or use the Twitter at Future Forum tag. Um, let's start with you in terms of today's news. The, the, the steel spine, the Western Metro has been tabled. The, the hot news in Western Sydney, while we're very supportive of the train and very keen for that 20 minute trip, let's deal with the elephant in the room early on. Rydalmere didn't get a look in, or Camellia, its, it's partner across the river. Um, the, it seemed a, a tough engineering gig once you chose stabling at Clyde. That was always going to be tougher to get up to right around across. Yeah. So recognising that engineering issue, and I'm sure Barney's had a few things to say and might, might come back to it because the university a little agreed uh, understandably there. Are you fearful at all that we learned the hard way with Alexandria, that we didn't at least provision for the future when maybe a station somewhere in Camellia or right around might have been used later on? Uh, look, um, thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for having me. And again, I mean, well done on the dialogue for actually having having today. Um, look, I, the bottom line is you can't be all things to all people, and the 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 reality is that this train line is not designed to stop at all places between Parramatta and the city. It's designed to replicate the Western Sydney T1 line, which will be at extreme capacity. Uh, in the early 2030s. It's designed to be, in, mess, in many ways, the first stage of the connection directly to Western Sydney Airport. And at the same time, the more stops you put in, the longer it takes to travel between the city and Parramatta, which is part of this. So it's not simply a train line for those who live between um, Parramatta and the city. It's a train line that serves 3 million people of Western Sydney. So for us, um, you know, ultimately there had to be some tough calls, um, acknowledging, you know, obviously those interests that were, you know, very keen for, um, you know, Rydalmere, Camellia and what have you. But, you know, the, the bottom line is that we want to be around that 20 minute journey time. Um, and, you know, this is a very big project. It's a very expensive project. It's the project of the 2020s. I mean, it's going to, to be a 10 year build. Um, we are in the market with the tunnelling very soon um, and we want to have those TBMs back in the ground uh, come 2022. So, um, you know, ultimately the EIS is, is out there for people to give their input. I'd encourage people, if they've got views on those stations, to obviously continue to put forward their viewpoints through the EIS process and directly to government, but um, that's the purpose of the build. Now, most of the community interest um, outside the heavy and highly disturbed group of engineering students and practitioners is about the bit above ground. The concept of metros being more of an urban renewal vehicle than a lot of normal transport is. Um, we're in a tough time financially between uh, bushfires, drought, COVID-19. There's a huge call on private, on, on public sector funding. Does this ex circumstance accelerate combined with I think the government's now moved now with Peter Arkestrat, the Productivity Commissioner for Planning, to finally get with sort of a value capture um, approach. Does this accelerate the opportunity for more private sector partnership above ground, above those metro stations as part of urban renewal? Yeah, look, I mean, the reality is we're going to wake up from the COVID crisis and find ourselves in um, recession. Um, and it's very sad to think that, you know, as a nation, we were humming along incredibly well. I think that the thing for us, though, is, and I've made this clear, which is, you know, all along I've held the belief that we can get on with our projects through the pandemic and to accelerate jobs post-pandemic, the best utilisation of taxpayer dollars would be to go into construction sites and, and keep the economy flowing through the construction it's a very, sector. It's a very Bradfield, Lang-esque 
approach, isn't it? That not only the, the economic impact of those projects on a recovering economy, but the confidence that it gives a community to know that we are still going ahead. There is still yeah. uh, life the other side of the bridge. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, you take, a, take the Metro City project, and when we, we've actually trying to accelerate it through the crisis. Um, we've seen productivity improvements across a number of our projects because truck movements are, are more free in an uncongested city. Mm. Um, and we are, you know, trying to manage um, our projects a little bit more constructively in light of not having commuters running around. So, you know, there, there is that capacity. And, and, and to your point, I mean, the, the critical signal in all of this is confidence. If the community can see governments getting on with their projects, despite now what will be, you know, a, a crash in revenues, not only for the private sector, but of course government as well, um, then, you know, that's the most important thing we can do. So, you know, we've got at the moment, you know, quite literally um, 130,000 jobs associated with transport in our projects, and we've kept them all going right through this whole disaster. Um, and my intention, as, as we see an easing of um, the pandemic, is we actually try and very much um, deliver good, uh, small, mid-sized, and, and the mega projects to which we talk. So, um, you know, I, having, I mean, yes, referring to, you know, the, the shapers of the city in bygone eras, the, the key thing for a for me at this stage is we've done it before 2011 we had to make some very tough decisions as to where to raise the finances to build these projects and we used the government's balance sheet to do it with asset recycling um, we're going to have to continue that but we're also going to have to look at the the cost of money i mean debt is manageable uh, given the extraordinary low interest rates um, and we, we've just got to do this sensibly so you know, naturally, we will look at everything um, in a pandemic world, but I think, you know, we, we've got to keep the tens of thousands of jobs going in Western Sydney, and this is the oh, way to yep. do it. Not wanting to look at gift horse in the mouth on the day that the EIS, uh, the Metro S came out. A um, couple other quick ones. Does it up the ante on Parramatta Light Rail? Um, no, or does this opportunity also allow you to think about things like trackless trams and other technology? No, I mean, I, I've said all along. Corridor. Yeah, I know there's probably some people who are listening in on this conversation right now, but I'd, I'd say this to everybody. I mean, we're getting on with Paramount Light Rail. Um, first stage is now underway. In fact, the Carlingford line, I got told by the project manager, that Carlingford line component of the project is actually two months ahead of schedule. Um, they're now looking at how they can devise ways to improve the build through each street because of what's happened with COVID. Yeah. So the work's going on there. In terms of stage two is obviously the Stage fun. two. Yeah, so, I mean, I understand the viewpoints of people in relation to stage two. I've said all along, the most important thing we can do to get on with that project is build the bridge between Melrose Park and Wentworth Point. That's the first point. Secondly, it would be, I think, uh, irresponsible to not go and actually have a look at better ways to build things and mass transit. So, you know, we are seeing... Uh, some incredible examples where if you have standalone laneways for trackless trams, that's potentially an option. Um, you've now got out of Europe, you know, lengthy articulated buses able to carry 200 people fully electric. If they're in a standalone white lane, you could potentially look at a whole raft of things, but. We, you know, we would ask the minister in supporting that concept and we're very open, have been to that. Yeah. You might also consider, consider it being a loop too and using coming maybe along the Victoria Road Corridor and back to Parramatta Road Corridor to open up the, the Auburn Granville Town Centre's Auto Alley at Parramatta, that sort of thing. So I think that's an opportunity. I think there's any number, of, any, any number of options, but the, I mean, one of the requirements in relation to West Connects in terms of planning was, of course, also mm. the Parramatta Road Corridor. So, We're still know, we, waiting on that one, yeah. Yeah, so uh, my, my sense is let's, let's have a look. We've got some exciting proposals happening out of Liverpool in terms of trackless trams and direct connections yep. to the sure airport. The, the innovation is showing electric, longer vehicles, which can carry a lot of people and fully automation, full automation. So, you know, I'm not going to plough into that project and then end up, you know, someone turning around in three years' time and saying, hey, Minister, we could have done it this yeah. way far more quickly and effectively. So we want to be able to do that. So that's, 
that's the reality of this. Let, let, yep, let me get to two last quick questions for before we go to our response panel and then come back to the, to the punters. One, we're also meant to have had an EIS for the Greater West, the North South Airport train out by now. It is not a state secret to know that Canberra and Macquarie Street have, have gone 15 rounds in, 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 call it robust negotiations over that, over that train. Um, are we any closer to getting stations predicted or nominated on between St Mary's and the Aerotropolis? And secondly, um, there's, a, there's a growing view that says that uh, both government, the one thing both governments tend to agree on is they want to go north with stage two rather than south. Um, just noting that Lindy Dietz from Camelot City Council is on the response panel and the people of MacArthur have sort of been let down ever since Whitlam promised them something in the early 70s. Should they have? Uh, is, is there other? Is is that a done deal? Uh, oh with, no! Look, I mean, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, the the, the bottom line is is that um, this is a a metro train for Western Sydney residents who live near the airport, um, and you know, this is uh, to to my to my very strong view. I mean, we've got the Commonwealth and the state uh, about to go hard in building a metro train between St Mary's and the airport. And that includes the design of train stations at the airport. Um, that has been the focus. Um, you know, it's obviously a very big build you know, cost-wise, but greenfield. Um, and, you know, in terms of where you go next, um, I think it's fair to say, I mean, logically connecting into the southwest makes more sense in a, in a way. But logic would also tell you, you can up the BCR and the value of the train line and the airport if you connect into the existing Northwest Metro. So it would be naive of governments not to explore the best option there for taxpayers and, and the people of greater Western Sydney. Um, but I've got to be honest with you, there's no decision point in relation to that. And, um, you know, I know that, again, it's an important time for stakeholders to be advocating their positions very strongly, but... Let me throw a last yeah. one to you before we go to the panel. More about you personally. This is a period of massive transformation we're all going through with COVID-19. You had your own transformation a little earlier um, yeah. with the bushfires fairly dramatically. Um, you spoke about politics won't be business as usual ever again. And I think the rest of the country and the world's catching up with their own trauma in more recent, more recent times. Um, notwithstanding, I assume you're not going to throw your hat in as the Liberal candidate for Edmund Monero if the seat becomes available to you and Barrow you know, levelling off at a tilt at Canberra. How do you see for you going ahead, politics not as usual? How does it manifest for the rest of us when a trailblazer like you has, has really built the cat on politics as usual? What, what do the rest of us expect? I mean, yeah, I, I hope, have I, I hope really? you have. Uh, yeah, I, look, I, uh, you know, look, it's, it's nice hearing I think that, we're ready but, for change. Oh, yeah, look, I, I, I think that, look, we've got a broken community. Um, you know, I still got people in the local area living in caravans on their blocks and tents on their blocks. We're about to get the first major sort of cold snap of the year coming through. So it's been horrible. I mean, you, you can't have a situation where um, with COVID, people haven't been able to get to the car in their cars and go and check on people because they don't want to spread the disease. And, you know, what overlays that, and I said this yesterday, I everyone just needs to take a chill pill on Ed Monero and just let Mike Kelly with dignity make a statement about himself. I mean, I, he's been a good local MP, yep. good guy. Um, I've never argued with him in 13 years, you know, and I'm liberal, he's Labor, but he, he, he's he got, he's he's done it well. Um, you tend to argue with those federal libs a bit. Yeah, but, but that's to stake out a position in the interest <laughs> yeah. of the state. I mean, yeah, you know, state before politics in that sense, but I, yeah. I do think, um, in terms of the, the need for dynamic shift, I think the biggest problem at the moment is politics is not attracting good people. You know, it it's become a a plaything of factions. It's become a plaything of on both sides. Yep. Um, it's all about self advancement. So, I don't. I think that's been the problem. I. You know, I think what's been heartening through the COVID thing is largely there has been a degree of bipartisanship in the approach. There's been odd days where there's been outbursts of stupidity, but... But there's civility the, has reigned as well. Correct. And and when people are sub, trying to survive, the last thing they want to do is turn on the television and see typically middle-aged blokes go and hell for leather. So 
my sense out of it is politics, the most important thing that can happen um, is people need to connect emotionally. Uh, they need to respect each other in terms of their circumstances. I, I, you know, I had to drive to Sydney the last two days and I drove past a couple of Centrelink offices on the way home. And, you know, there was queues out the front door. Now, imagine how those poor people who've lost everything through no fault of their own um, because of a virus, which no one can see. I and mean, with the fires, you could physically and tangibly feel it, see it. Yeah. With, with the virus, it's around us, but we can't see it and it's until we get sick then it becomes a very real problem so i i just think it's it's a it, yeah. politicians need to show a degree of maturity that the rest of the community expects from them in terms of their advocacy and, and doing this well and we've got to embrace each other a bit more i mean i i have been incredibly complimentary of the rtbu over recent weeks because they've done a brilliant job um you know before the fires i probably would have been a little bit more like a there's transformation you know. and Andrew Constance embracing industrial movement is uh, there, there well, is Well, yeah, but, but why change. wouldn't I, I mean, yeah, but why wouldn't I praise yep. David Babineau and Alex Glassens for the way that they have worked yeah. with the agency to get people and make people safe. And we've got a long, we've got a long way to go. I mean, what we do and everybody in on this call, we've all got a responsibility to see where we can drive the jobs growth, not expend energies in the wrong way and, and, and go from there. With that as a segue, I'm going to introduce, before I do, Minister, with your indulgence, hopefully, because we're a bit of a late start, we've got a few minutes at the back end and we stretch a little past our... Sorry, um, yeah, no, by all means, I apologise for the technology. No, no, no problem at all. Um, uh, rural and regional NBN, it's always fun. It's a whole other debate for a whole other uh, uh, forum later on. Um, can I throw to uh, Theo Sakodjus, who... I like the, the photo of his high school yearbook that's up on screen. When you, oh, there's the real, there's the real Theo. The hairy version. You're muted, Theo. Too. Theo's going to run a response panel with Lindy Dietz and Barney Glover and, and G. Song, and uh, then we're going to come back. Uh, feel free to drop in, Minister, if they're starting to annoy you or annoy through the response panel. Drop in, no problem. But I might hand over to Theo. Thanks, mate. Thank you, Christopher. This is uh, my COVID look. I have aged in, in six weeks and grown a beard accordingly. Uh, thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you for your time and um, our hearts and thoughts and minds are with you through everything you've been through and everything you keep driving for our community Thanks. in spite of that, mate. So um, keep up the, the great work. Um, everyone, we have uh, three great panellists. Um, uh, Ji Song from uh, Lend Lease, uh, a tremendous um, agent and champion of Western Sydney and a son of Western Sydney you know, as a company driving forward. Barney Grover, uh, as previously introduced by Chris, a tremendous thought leader, and Lindy Dietz, who's driving the, the great city of Campbelltown um, onwards and upwards to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, the dialogue set forward a really clear agenda around recovery, reform and re-engagement and being the path forward um, on the back of COVID and as we look to take forward of both the opportunities in Western Sydney uh, and broadly the investment that's being made on the back of the government as well as private sector as they come in behind that. So really interested in, and as we frame around recovery, um, what are those picks we need to be making? Where are those opportunities? And where is that moment and those actions that we can really look to do something different? So in that regard, Barney, I'm gonna to throw to you to begin with. Captain's pick. Uh, you're not known for doing that. You're a much more measured and um, scientific man. Um, you like the counsel of the people around you. But that aside, if you had one pick, one thing that you could do that you would be investing in or undertaking coming straight off the back of the COVID crisis to drive us into recovery, uh, what would it be and what would generate the most impact for Western Sydney? Uh, thanks, Theo. And uh, if I could also acknowledge the Minister and um, while I might be disappointed about uh, Rydalmere, Minister, you can't uh, doubt the, uh, this government and the investment you've made in infrastructure, and which will go on. And uh, the metro is great, certainty is great. Um, you know, I think we look at a whole range of options around Rydalmere and, and we'll continue to liaise with, uh, with you and the department in relation to that. But uh, congratulations on Thanks, yet another important step forward and your own contribution to it, which is remarkable. Um, look, my, having said that, if I was to say one thing, connectivity to the airport is a crucial part of it. The minister's just indicated uh, what the options might be there. Obviously, we have a great interest around Warrington. Uh, to see that connection from St Mary's to the airport and to the southwest 
uh, would be a crucial part of what I'd say that we should get on with. The airport, it's interesting, we're going to move into a different era around air travel because of COVID. Uh, it'll recover, but it might recover in different ways. And that might shape our airport in a, I think it's still a vitally important part of 2026. Let's not delay anything, but I think we need to think through what air travel is going to look like. And I think this is an opportunity because infrastructure stimulus is, so, is going to be so critical that we think about that connectivity more than just the spine from St Mary's to the airport. But I would, and I know Lindy's here online, I'd be very much encouraging that connection through the southwest at the same time. And let's do it right. If we can get up to the northwest, that would con connect in a, in a vitally important, generationally significant way. Lindy, throwing to you, I, I know you've been called at various times the, the queen of connectivity and trying to really get the southwest connected and taking advantage of things. But you're also not a one-trick pony. So yeah, what... Uh, you know, what would be your captain's pick? What's that one thing that would drive the real growth on the back of COVID coming forward that leave the best benefit for Campbelltown and the MacArthur region, but equally take advantage and opportunities for the Parkland City and Western City more broadly? You're just on mute, Lindy. Oh, okay, sorry. I couldn't find myself. You're all good. Uh, I'm the third hat on the hat trick uh, for the unmuting button. Sorry, guys. Um, thank you, Theo, and um, hello, Minister, and thank you for your time today. Um, look, I think any infrastructure investment is critical to economic recovery, but particularly in the Western Parkland City, um, where there's already been um, infrastructure committed, uh, just not funded for delivery. Um, the need has been determined, um, the benefits known, um, the financial investment is now what's required. So sensibly, um, I would bring forward um, the projects that government has already strategically planned and committed for in the Western Parkland City, uh, that being the North South Rail uh, and the rapid bus connections to each of the metropolitan clusters in the Western Sydney, Western City, sorry. Um, the great economic divide between the west and the east um, and now and the further investment in the eastern and central cities uh, to the absence of the west will only exacerbate the uh, delay in economic recovery for the western parkland city so i just think um, it's a no-brainer from my perspective so jason um i know that len leases um uh, I've got a significant experience when it comes to activating precincts and driving on the back of transport orientated development. The announcements today of the EIS on East West is obviously, I, as John Burton has talked about, a significant opportunity. Um, yeah, from Len Lisa's perspective, where do you see being the best play? And I'm really interested in your perspective between that investment in large ma major projects and a whole lots of small projects and how we activate at, at those two levels uh, across the region. Okay, um, thanks Theo and, and thanks Minister for your time. Um, look, oh, gratefully I think the Minister's made our captain's pick for us because we genuinely think that Metro West is gonna be game changing for the state. And um, that ability to link the economic engine room of the Sydney CBD with the Parramatta CBD by a modern automated rapid mass transport system that is going to have profound effects on um, the way the economic and focal point of the city has got all the state will move from the east to the west. And like John and, and Chris mentioned earlier with East London, we see great parallels, except that movement in London was from west to east. Um, in the short term, there's an ability to employ thousands of white collar professionals immediately in terms of their starting the design and planning of the infrastructure. And long term, there's gonna be fundamental and profound benefits from an economic productivity perspective around how demographics are spread and how that affects the way we live, work and play. So from a precinct perspective, we, we're, we're incredibly excited to ultimately have the opportunity to participate in, in the creation of precinct developments in Westmead, um, Parramatta and SOPA. But in terms of what we can control, we have strategic land holdings in Roselle Bay. And as off the back of COVID and off the back of the Metro West invent, um, investment, our strategy is now to accelerate that development. So we feel like we can 
deliver thousands of homes, a large portion of social and affordable homes, before that base precinct station is delivered. And we think that's going to support the business case for Metro West. And we think they'll also aid to the day one activation of, of that precinct. And that value that we create, we want to try and share with the state to help stimulate the economy and create some social value. So we've got plans to help create a, a new bay run around Roselle Bay, linking our vision with the vision for the fish markets as a, as a viable alternative to the Dremoyen Bay run. And we also have a vision to try and restore and reactivate the old Glebe Island Bridge to create that economic relationship between the Bay's Precinct, Rose, um, Piermont and, and the Sydney CBD. Um, in terms of your question around small projects and big projects, you know, we, we see the benefit of pursuing both typologies of projects. In terms of small projects, we find that any investment that we make provides a higher cost benefit ratio in terms of economic stimulus and the promotion of secondary development. Um, we find that the investment in our greenfield developments pushes cash deeper into the economy and our local supply chain benefits. From a, a large precinct perspective, we believe there's an amplifying effect and impact from our investment and there's a scalability to those benefits and the structural uplift that comes from those precinct developments has a broader impact and a broader benefit socially and economically to the wider I'm interested economy. in picking up on that point with Lindy. Lindy, I, I've, you've, I've heard you speak recently about the, the trauma and the damage to small business and medium businesses in your region in particular. How important, because big projects take time, the Minister's talked about the lag times, making sure we make the investments right. Um, how important are those small localised projects to start getting the activity in your town centres and starting to get those small businesses, sole traders active and operating um, in a position to take advantage of the major projects as they flow through downstream? Um, Theo, it's critical. Um, small to medium business uh, is really, really suffering at the moment. We have lost 30% already. Um, of our small to medium business uh, because of COVID-19. Um, I think there is great opportunity uh, for them to get involved. If I gave you some local examples, we've got some amazing local industry that can pivot really quickly in terms of their operations. Uh, we have an example of Bresmed in Ingleburn, an Ingleburn company that's uh, producing concepts and prototypes and iterations of valves for alternative ventilators and that wasn't their core business pre-COVID. Um, we've got big uh, concrete factories. We've got all of those things that are actually going to stimulate the big major projects. So actually involving and engaging those small to medium um, businesses are essential, I think, to the life of our city. So Barney, the minister touched on it earlier when talking about stage two for light rail, but Lindy's just touched on it there about how businesses are pivoting and evolving. We've seen a lot of commentary from people almost starting to see, do we need a new sense of nationalising and bringing local business and prioritising Australia over other things, even at the expense of cost. To me, it seems like a tremendous opportunity to harness the brain power of the region, to not go back to the future, but to transform to a new future. What are your thoughts on how coming out of COVID and with major infrastructure and the business community that we've got around Western Sydney, how we can look to innovate and really drive to a new normal that's about a new way of doing business as opposed to just trying to re-engineer you know, relics of the past? Well, I think we're beginning to see the debate going on about Australia being as self-sufficient as it can be. COVID has stretched us in a lot of ways that we didn't anticipate. And rapidly, I know within the university, we've had to uh, transition nearly 1,200 units of study online in two weeks. And to do it well and to do it in a world-class context has been extraordinary. That's been the case in universities all around the country. So higher education is never going to be the same. Technology is going to influence the way in which we do business and the way we reach out and support businesses. One of the other really interesting things that's emerging as we Zoomify the world at the moment is we're engaging with each other like this, and I congratulate the dialogue for, for the uh, uh, way in which uh, Chris and the team are connecting people together in a way that overcomes some of the tyranny of traffic and distance, 
we need to address all of that post COVID, but it's great to see we can still stay together. And we're gonna learn from that and develop from it. I think Western Sydney's got a great opportunity uh, as part of the rebuilding and reframing of our economy. Um, clearly, there's gonna be some areas of focus that's coming around the Aerotropolis, for example. I mean, one of the crucial things uh, to get right now is to bring some projects forward. The Aerotropolis is a crucial part around the airport's gonna be critical to that and the way business will engage. GPOP is a really crucial part of it. We talked a moment ago, you said Parramatta to Sydney Olympic Park. I think Jay said that. I think it's Westmead to Sydney Olympic Park. And last year, the University of Sydney and Western Sydney University put forward our plan for bigger, better and sooner for that connectivity. Well, I, I think the imperative now is even stronger. The Metro decision today by the minister gives us certainty around that. And that project and how we activate it, as Jay just said, we can activate it in a variety of ways. What we want to do at Sydney Olympic Park to connect with uh, small to medium sized enterprises and startups and innovations, the way Launchpad is our, in a, our business incubator hub is now taking off in Parramatta, taking off in Liverpool, will be great in Campbelltown and elsewhere. I think we have a really exciting set of precincts in the West that should become a major yep. focus of what stimulates this recovery mode, and then the changing nature of our economy. So Christopher, yep. back to you. And a question that I think would be interesting to the minister in that regard is, what needs to change um, from what we've been doing historically, whether it's in regulation or it's approach or mindset, for us to truly unlock what we're doing forward and don't make the same mistakes? Over to you, mate. I'll supplement that to, to Andrew with, as I said, a lot of our current thinking is is influenced by first our trip to East London last year, which is very instructive for a West Sydney community, particularly about the role private sector can play as better partner with you in the urban renewal and the importance of transport in as a social policy lever, not just economic. But then also for you here now, um, we you know it's interesting about you know, G from Lend Lease and Lindy here, that partnership, Dick Dusseldorp, that basically developed, you know, first it was John MacArthur, then it was Dick Dusseldorp that developed Campbelltown, um, developing MacArthur Station, Bradbury, sort of things with private money. Is one of those big reform agendas for you, um, despite running a Herculean public sector fund, you're running the best sort of labour public works program the world's ever seen. Do you look for a time now to flick the switch back to a bigger role for the private sector and partnering you going forward in this ambitious infrastructure program? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, absolutely. I mean, in terms of the construction side of things and, and the asset maintenance side of things, that's a given. But just listening to the panel, there's a couple of things that I think kept coming out in my own mind as I was listening. Firstly, um, population growth. Um, you know, as, as a transport minister who's grown the number of services on a weekly basis by in, in excess of 40,000, uh, you know, and, and the last five years, it's been nuts. I mean, we've seen train patronage go from 300 million passenger trips to 420 million. Right. I think there is a big debate that needs to be had about population growth. So because immigration levels are going to be drastically affected by COVID, um, what that does in terms of supply and demand across business is going to be, a, you know, a very big question for us all. Sadly, I think also we are going to see structural unemployment. So there'll be people in their mid fifties who potentially could never work again as a result of what's happened. Um, and so we've got to put our minds to how, how we can meet that challenge because the growth projections also underpin the infrastructure projects that we're seeking to deliver over the next, uh, you know, 40 plus years. So I don't think there's any dispute in terms of the program. I think it'd be hard pressed to find a liberal or labor politician in Western city who would be opposed to, the direction because I think business supports it, the university sector supports it, we all support it. The West so, is prepared to pay to play. Uh, to a point, I think, Chris, you gotta you gotta be careful in saying that because again, at the end of the day, how much private equity is there going to be really around mm. um, to to facilitate this? So, you know, if we if we see the the pause button on immigration and you know, I mean Harry Triggerbroth will tell you, I mean, the, the, the confidence level in the Chinese to invest in the property market is something which, you know, the reality is that that has played a major impact in terms of the property market over the last 10 years. Um, uh, you know, what we see in terms of foreign investment in that, that space is going to be an interesting 
observation. But if we are going to be uh, more nationalistic in our approach, um, which, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing because I think globalisation has delivered some incredible outcomes, but at the same time, it's also delivered some incredible problems. We've seen that where, you know, we, we become too dependent on China and, you know, for our pharmaceuticals and PPE and everything else. And look what's happened around the world. It's been around growth absolutely too. great. So, uh, I mean, I think we've got to ask ourselves, well, okay, what is the shape of Australia in five years time or 10 years time? But how do we actually get to that pathway? So we all have this vision around Western Sydney, Aerotropolis being an incredible success, Parramatta obviously becoming a very significant CBD because it is the centre of Sydney. It's no longer really Western Sydney. It's the centre of Sydney. Um, and we've got to, the, the trick to this will be keeping governments focused on the investments and the discipline around that. The thing that also gives me heart um, in, from the investment side of things is that I do think our superannuation funds uh, will continue to look towards, you know, good return investments, yeah. low risk. And, and if you've got regulated asset base, then that's even more appealing. So, uh, you know, if you, I, if, you, I, if you talk population and immigration there, I mean, one last question I'll throw to Adam, who's got some of the questions that the pundits have said in now and before. How can you, though, quite rightly use population to determine your, your, your um, spend of infrastructure and tell the Sydney community that the northern beaches of Sydney won't have any more people. They don't want anyone else to come and live there, but they're going to get a beaches link when the A6, A3 congested corridor through the centre of Sydney isn't prioritised for others. Surely using government's own population projections now, which have changed since your first right. transport project was done, that we can say bye-bye to the beaches link and say hello to an A6, A3. Road well, you just made, you've just Campbelltown rapid bus, or you just made a big mistake, Chris, because the Princess Highway is the most important infrastructure in the state. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, absolutely great. How did I forget uh, so, people the South Coast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, to to be honest with you, that that either or concept around infrastructure is a dangerous one because the reality is that we should be using our infrastructure to drive jobs growth, given the vulnerabilities we now have and now face it gets cash swirling around the state economy because people have money to spend. Yep. So that's the first point. Like we, we, if we, if we don't have the cash flowing, then how can we even see any one of those 30% of business, small businesses that have potentially folded, come back to life. And we've got a, we, we've got an obvious challenge here. If we get a second wave of infections with COVID and small businesses have to close for a second time, this is why we've got to be very careful in the way in which we manage this we could end up with a situation where um, businesses will be gone forever and that structural unemployment will be very significant. So uh, for me, I think staying the course with the vision, um, continuing to work with the private sector in terms of their confidence and their ability to invest. Value capture as a concept, I've always said this, it only I think can work in, Australia, in an Australian context based on our population with station precincts on a metro train. That's it. I think if you're going to look at value capture realistically, it'll only ever contribute at best 10% towards the capital cost of a project. But the only place where it can really work, given the, the very nature of the precinct developments, is around metro stations. That's it. Uh, that's my view. And I, I, I think the Jim Betzes of this world would probably back that in. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's important because otherwise it just becomes a betterment tax. And I don't think any government in their right is going to go down a betterment levy approach uh, because it's failed before. And quite frankly, we've got a lot of people, particularly in Western Sydney, who have paid taxes all their lives and should be entitled to a taxpayer delivered and funded um, you know, transport project to help them with their quality of life. And that's why the Northwest project uh, has been, you know, that's why there was no value capture applied with it because, I mean, other than a bit of land banking from government, but uh, you know, the, the reality is there wasn't a betterment levy applied there because those generations of Australians living in the Northwest should have had a train line put in a long time ago. I think the beauty with what we're dealing with a blank sheet of paper around the Aerotropolis is that gives us the capacity to use the infrastructure to grow as opposed to putting the infrastructure in as a retrofit. And that's, uh, that's the exciting part there. Thanks, Minister. As Christopher mentioned, we've got a few questions from the from the, our listeners and watchers out there. Um, Minister, you flagged your intent earlier to move the state's bus fleet to zero emissions technology. 
Are you looking for ideas in this area from the private sector as part of the upcoming tender for Sydney's bus contracts or will it be a separate project? And is there scope for electric or hydrogen bus manufacturing and maintenance to be a growth industry for GWS? Look, naturally you would use the franchise uh, proceeds and savings to invest back into a sustainable fleet. What's driving me in this regard is the health impacts of diesel particulates on our community, particularly in Western Sydney. Uh, we've seen in cities around the world like London, Amsterdam, Paris, um, a poisoning of the population because of diesel. And, it, you know, I want us to get with the program. So it's got the health and environmental impacts. So what we're doing is we'll be engaging with our private operators, uh, but also and importantly manufacturers to see what's possible in terms of a pathway and set some clear targets where we will phase out diesel buses. Uh, every other jurisdiction in Europe's doing it. Um, and the whole of life cost for an electric bus is on a par with diesel. So, you know, we, we have failed, I think, dismally, where we have not seen air quality monitoring put in place by transport uh, to actually test the impact in terms of the high concentration of diesel particulates on the community. Uh, we know it's having a major impact in Europe in terms of health outcomes. So if it's happening now, I bet you it's happening here. So we want to be able to change that. Um, and of course, you know, it, it makes sense in terms of transitioning the economy, um, in terms of uh, the, the climate change policies of federal and state governments to, to, to play our part, which is where I think we have an obligation to, uh, to transition and do so affordably and effectively. And there's 7,000 diesel buses running around Sydney. Um, I think it's time we, we started this work extensively. Indeed. Um, I should mention, I think we'll, we were scheduled to finish up at 11 o'clock. Um, right. But if you're okay to push on to yeah, the next no, 10 I'm, minutes. I'm, I'm homebound today, so it's okay. Brilliant. Um, the next one comes through from an anonymous attendee. Um, can we have more clarity on Sydney Metro West and Greater West timelines? When can we expect an operational launch? Um, well, again, um, the, the key element in this is that um, we, we've said by this, the end of this decade, we'd have it in, in place. Um, it is a very big project. It's got a very big price tag and the funding profile obviously needs to be delivered across that, that you know, obviously that, that footprint. Um, so, uh, you know, the bottom line is, and this is the, uh, the end game, the trick for it is getting the work underway. That's the, that's the key point. Um, We've seen Metro Northwest, I mean, from its inception to its delivery, I mean, you're looking at a pretty much an eight year sort of, sort of build. So, you know, and commissioning. So, you know, this is a largely underground project, but there will obviously be elements to it, which require a lot of at grade work. Um, and I would expect to just get on with the job and we're, we, you know, we're, we're seeing that now we've, we're moving ahead with stabling facilities. Um, we're working to get the tunnel boring machines back in the ground. Um, but, you know, this is the biggest project in the state's history um, and we have to get it right. Uh, Andrew, so the, the, the federal government promised an, a train to the airport at Badgerys Creek when it opened in 2026. The state government didn't make the same promise. Would you imagine at this point there will be trains meeting the first planes that land, notwithstanding whatever might happen with the airport now with timing and COVID. But yeah, I think, it, is, I think it's Is it an ish yeah. or a hard, hard date? Uh, look, I think it's an ish, to be honest, realistically. I think, you know, depending on the... I mean, the aim will be to have it as close as possible. I, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense to have a train line open when the airport opens. But, you know, again, it'll, it'll come down to the timing of when the airport actually opens. But... And to have trains uh, running when planes are running, 24-hour yeah, train to meet 24-hour yeah. airport? Yeah, so I think with the community, I mean, they're just going to be happy to see very significant projects well and truly through their build um, in the next decade. And, you know, if, if the alignment is out by a few months or whatever it might be, Fair enough. Um, and there's it's a very tough lady hard, from I mean, Campbelltown there watching. What, is, what does she have to do to convince you that stage two of Airport Rail should be to Campbelltown and not to, not to Blacktown? There's sort of north versus south 
argument. Oh, I, I know the feds reckon they can sell an airport better if they're linking to Castle Hill for a stage. I, I understand that argument. But I also understand the argument of the, just like North West was promised for years and got nothing. Campbelltown's been on a promise set since 72. Absolutely. And do a more. Yeah, I mean, which is why, you know, gazetting corridors and getting those things right is what I've been on about. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to be potentially in this role when this, that decision gets made. But I think having an, a, a good process for uh, the people of Campbelltown to be able to to participate in the best way forward is important. Um, you know, the, the thing is, regardless of where you live, this is not just about the mass transit solutions. We've got to be looking at the first mile, last mile solutions. We've got... I think it's fair to say one thing and one observation I have made with uh, light rail projects, um, you know, we've had as much success with the turn up and go high frequency double decker bus running through the Northern beaches as anything really. Uh, so it, the more standalone we can put our transport first, the, the motor way, and uh, sorry, the, the, the car network, the, the, the motor vehicle network, the better, um, so for us, it, you know, look, I think there's got to be a process. I mean, we've done some early analysis in relation to all of this. I think logic would tell you, um, you know, uh, if governments are smart and we can get good federal and state working together, a good sale price on the airport could very well mean, you know, these projects starting construction more quickly. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer everyone, you know, focusing in on end date and when this is going to be complete. I'm actually more of the viewpoint, I'm more interested in the start date because once we can get things progressing from a construction perspective, that gives me a lot more confidence that, you know, no one will come along and pull the pin. Because I think one of the big problems we've had with infrastructure over the generations is, has been the, the political risk associated with the project. Um, so, look, I think the aim will be to get both tiers, or both tiers of government working together, and I think you know, getting the, the the federal political alignment because I don't think the state's balance sheet is going to be able to deliver, you know, the, the rail lines that we're talking about in terms of their magnitude um, anytime soon. Given that we're we're having to fork out very significant dollars between Metro West and and the the Metro Western Sydney Airport, in and deliver panel, everything else. Any of the panelists want to? Um Ask question of the minister, or we got him as well. Lindy, oh. you're marshalling the forces. <laughs> yeah, um, minister. Well, I can I ask you this? Look, we at least get a hard date on the rapid bus from the airport. I mean, if I mean that, I think there's still some confusion. I don't know if that's Canberra or Macquarie Street who's responsible, but ah, it'll be. I mean, it'll be us. I mean, look, a good standalone. I mean, we have seen um, bus rapid transport around the city, and you know its effectiveness. I do think increasingly what we will see is longer vehicles able to carry more people uh, and the frequency of them being a lot better if it's, it's properly planned for. So, you know, uh, the, the, the um, B line in the Northern beaches, I mean, it's, it's over half a billion dollars spent. Why? Because we've built six commuter car parks alongside it at, at, you know, innovative, um, you know, express bus stops along the route so that people can get into the city quicker. So, I mean, that's been a roaring success. So I, I just think, that, you know, it's not just a case of putting a bus on the road. It is, you know, working out the commuter car parks around it or what into the future will be, you know, automated vehicle. Lindy, it sounds like a nice stations. argument for an upgrade at MacArthur Station too to service the health education precinct. Yeah, look, Minister, I think, you know, it's obviously there's evidence to say that cities in, that invest in significant public transport uh, obviously have a higher degree of success with their, you know, in terms of economic growth. Yeah. I think um, one of my questions to you would be that the Prime Minister, the Premier and eight mayors signed off on an agreement with City Deals uh, that, Campbelltown, for example, would get rapid bus from day one of the opening of the airport. So yeah. that the fastest growing region of MacArthur in Australia could leverage off those opportunities. But And I, I agree with you, you know, like the importance of uh, gazetting corridors. But to date, none of that has happened for us. Do you have any idea of a timeline of 
when there'll be some serious corridor uh, examination done and a rapid... No, no, I'm sorry, but I, I have to dispute that. The, the corridor examination has been done. It's complete. We're now at gazettal phase. Uh, and that, that that's that's the point. Like we we know where the corridors are. We know where the rail lines have got to go. Um, and in terms of in terms of bus rapid transit, I mean the beauty with those types of projects is they're not a ten year build. I mean I delivered B line on one of the busiest corridors in the country. Um, the beauty with Campbelltown to Western Sydney Airport is I've got a lot more options in terms of how you might design a bus network with a the express high frequency turn up and go services, not the typical bus timetabled 65 seater that you know we're traditionally used to, but the high frequency innovative electric vehicles that, that can move a lot of people very quickly per hour. And so, you know, my, I, you know I've been a fan of um, the, the double deckers, obviously uh, in terms of Beeline, but the more I see the, the buses out of France, for instance, uh, with RATP, where they are, you know, four doors on the side can carry significant numbers. Um, I think we need to look very closely at, at how that can work. But, I mean, in terms of just betting it down, I mean, we can get on with the transport planning around the best way that the uh, bus rapid network will be in place um, and making sure that it is certainly there from the day the doors open at the airport. We've got that time frame. It's not like a, it's not like a train line development. That's fantastic. That's fantastic news, Minister, because yesterday we were in a meeting with Transport where they said that they didn't have any funds for railway, uh, railway corridor preservation or rapid bus preservation. So I'm well, really heartened to hear. Yeah, that. I mean, but I, I'm, yeah, I mean, look, you will always have those types of bureaucratic discussions. Sometimes they're designed so that you turn around the next day and say something to the Minister, but uh, the reality and the hard, cold reality. Long live ministerial have, discretion. Yeah, um, we have had, yeah, welcome to my world. Uh, their budget's 25 billion, by the way. Um, so, um, you know, look, I think the, the thing about it is, is that the city deal gives a commitment from everybody. Um, I have to be honest, I, I have loved, uh, and I do love it when local government really steps up in terms of public transport. Um, and we've seen that with Liverpool. I think Liverpool is showing the way in terms of their thinking and their innovation. Um, I've had a good relationship with the city of Sydney around light rail um, for the city. So, you know, I think there's a really good opportunity because I, I you know, yes, I appreciate Paramount that. Parramatta started it with the Western Sydney, with the Parramatta light rail. Yeah. 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 There's, there, there's the exact examples, um, you know, and it's not a case of me expecting local government to, dipped in the pockets and deliver hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it's, it's more about how we can work together in an innovative way to get the best, best outcomes. So. I think Adam's got one last question. Just a from quick the one before we wrap up, Super, thank you. Um, the current pandemic has shown us that we can move and work differently. Um, are there any other ways, less expensive ways to free up capacity on, on our transport network, demand management strategies, work from home, et cetera? And yeah. how can government influence those outcomes? Well, I mean, look, I, I think at the heart of it is innovation. So, you know, we, we're now seeing, we've got this challenge over the next couple of months where we're going to have to use trip planning apps to get people to think differently around peak hour. We want to shred peak hour to be a thing of the past because what worries us is that COVID could, you know, be easily spread in a peak hour scenario. So we need, we need people to be thinking differently about how they move around at various times of the day. So, you know, we, we had in place, um, certainly in terms of um, how we can work alongside industry and business to change the way people move across the network and use technology to achieve that. I think that's, that's important. What COVID's done to the transport network has seen a drop from 2.2 million passengers a day down to, you know, it bottomed out at about 400,000 a week or so back, we're now at about 480,000 and I'm expecting that to just gradually start to increase again uh, as we see schools go back and, and, you know, more and more businesses start to, to reopen. Um, that said though, um, you know, we, we know that productivity of course is affected by inefficient transport systems. Um, 
and poor connection and telecommunications. And so I think there are some very big and key learnings out of this. Unfortunately, what we are at risk um, over the next couple of months is, you know, we, we are going to see, with the easing of restrictions, rates of infection increase again. The, I mean, COVID's here, we can't escape it. Um, so how our transport network uh, responds in that regard is going to be a very significant challenge. I have deliberately kept every service going right through this. I have not turned a service off. Unlike others, some other state jurisdictions where they actually wound up their public transport, we've kept it going. So um, we, we want to look at ways in which we can incentivize people to travel in the intra-peak periods um, and do it more safely. So therein lies the challenge for the next month. Minister, can I take the opportunity so we'll have a hard finish at 11.15. Um, this is our first Future Forum Online, the digital dialogue, as we call it. Um, we're a bit of a late start, but we came home with a wet sail. Firstly, to the to the panellists, uh, to G. Son, who had to leave us for a limited meeting, to the uh, Vice Chancellor um, Emeritus, Barney Glover, and to the boss lady of the South West, uh, to Lindy Dietz, who's, uh, who's always um, relied upon to be a, a strong advocate for the region. Uh, brought together by the, by the ringmaster, the bearded ringmaster, the psychologist, at Deloitte. A big thanks to Deloitte and Western Sydney Uni for supporting our Future Forum. Um, the two groups that, you know, they're probably the two leading, outside the dialogue, the two leading thinking organisations in the entire region of thought leadership. So we thank, we thank that. But on behalf of Adam and myself and the dialogue, firstly, Minister, to, to Rod Staples, Elizabeth Mildwater, to uh, Howard Collins and all of the team, the essential workers at Transport for New South Wales who have kept the trains running, kept the buses going, kept the, the traffic lights working, you name it. It's been a remarkable achievement and in in a, in an agile achievement. Uh, one thing we can guarantee is the government's been back in back in, in front and in charge across the country and in New South Wales. Um, I said, we strongly want to see the tilt back to the private sector to help you come out of it, but government's carried us through it remarkably. So please pass on our thanks to all of your teams. And to you personally, I know we can't come back down and buy some scones on the South Coast yet, but Not pretty yet. soon we'll, we'll bring I'll a delegation you. of Western Sydney to the South Coast where I'll the traditional holiday business. home of Western Sydney anyway. We want the Westies back, um, spending some money locally. Um, and as soon as we get the green light, um, we encourage them to do it. We know yeah. the communities of South Coast are suffering. Um, we know the ravaging of what fire can be just with a little pandemic thrown in on top of drought and bushfire. It's been an interesting time to be in government. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, for no, me. Chris, Chris, thank you to the dialogue and, and what you guys do. And thank you for your sentiment about the fires. Can I just say to everybody, thank you for your kind message. I just have one pop up then. You know, look, it, it, it's, it's been a bugger of a year and a lot of people walk around saying this has been so unfair. We don't understand what we've done. But, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of broken people and we're just trying to put lives back one by one together and, you know, thank you for every, all the support. I, you know, during February, the, the way in which people came down here and supported business, people from Western Sydney was amazing. I can't, I can't tell you the number of people from Western Sydney who come up to me in the middle of the street and just say, hey, we're just here to buy those scones that you talk of. And can I have a station to ride on me? <laughs> no, they didn't actually. But, but yeah, but anyway, but they, they did come from the scones. But um, yeah, look, I, I, you know, I think this is what makes us who we are. And, um, you know, it has been a truly you know, all in effort to make sure that our rates of infection around COVID have not exploded like US, UK and Italy and Spain and everywhere in between. And, you know, it just shows what, how special we are when we, we all think together. So the dialogue is part of that journey and, and obviously, you know, to our leaders and our community leaders throughout Western Sydney, it's important. So well, mate, wherever your journey takes you, and it's been an interesting one, and I know it's an interesting one ahead, it's not a standard political journey at the moment. Um, there, this has been, you are the Bradfield of the West at the moment, the $80 million no. man pumping projects and we'll continue. We'll still, we'll still argue with you about exactly where they should be and when they should be, but nothing takes away from the fact that they're there in the largest single burst we've ever seen. Yeah, and um, it's important. we'll open up our community and we'll do our bit to, to contribute. So to everybody and those online, thank you for your time. It's a bold experiment. We'll be back, I promise, again. It seems to have worked. Uh, the Premier said she wanted to see how you went before she'd do one. So, uh, yeah, we'll yeah no, it might, I apologise for being a bit late at the start, but we just had a few tech issues. But um, I'm sure in Sydney they can iron them out a little bit better than what we can down here. So <laughs> thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, everybody. Have a, have a nice day. Yeah. Yeah.